Hello again. If you've seen our first two videos, we're looking at the book of Jonah, looking at this story about how God seems to call the worst man to deliver a message to the worst people. And we look at that and try to understand what God is doing through this story. We mentioned in the first video that, of course, there are one message, three appointments, two questions which appear in the story. Yesterday we learned a little bit about Jonah, that Jonah had a relationship with the people of God, he was part of them, he knew God, and God called him to a very particular purpose, called him to deliver a message of judgment to the Assyrians, to this people group that was the power of the day, that was a constant threat to Jonah and his people. God calls him and gives him a message, and Jonah's response is to run the opposite direction, to get as far away not only from the people he's supposed to deliver a message to, but as far away, we're told, from the presence of God as he can. Now, some of that thinking may be due to the culture that Jonah lives in. We're going to learn certain things today about the way many people perceived gods, deities that they held. In much of the ancient world, the view of a god was very much territorial, local. So the idea was each god or deity had control over their territory. And if you ventured out of that territory, the authority and power of that god decreased. So oftentimes, this was a way to control different groups from pushing into each other's territory. And if you expanded to another territory and you were successful, well then you conveyed the belief that your god was big enough to push other gods out of their territory. So it is possible that in Jonah's mind, Jonah is thinking, if I run far enough from the land of Israel, from the land that God had given to his people, I will escape his presence. I will get away from his control and his power, and therefore I will not be held responsible to deliver his message. So this is what Jonah does. Jonah gets on a ship we heard last day, and he heads off in the opposite direction. So we have his, his ship here, and off they're going. He's off on a voyage, traveling to this place, Tarshish. So let's read what happens next. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down to the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So let's look at what's happening now. The scripture is very clear. It says that God, the Lord, is intervening. So a great storm comes up, and it says that God hurls this storm upon the ship. So the wind is blowing, the waves begin to grow, and the men on the ship, the sailors, begin to panic. So what do they do? They call out to their gods, and we get the sense that there's a variety of men on the ship with a variety of different beliefs and each is calling out to his or her individual deity calling on them to provide rescue. They're also taking practical steps. They're trying to lighten the ship so they can control it more and it not be so influenced by wind and waves. None of these things seem to be working. As they cry out to each of their gods the wind and the waves continue. Jonah, interestingly enough, is not part of this frenzy. He's down below in the ship, down in the hold, and he's asleep. 
apparently missing everything that's going on. So then we have the captain coming to him and saying to him, so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a, give a thought for us that we may not perish. So the captain finds Jonah asleep and says, Jonah, what are you doing? We're in a crisis. We're all calling out to our gods. You call out to your God and maybe one of these gods might respond to us. Then we see another interesting step that fits very much into the culture of the time. The men are trying to determine what's going on because their belief is if this strange disaster has befallen them, it is likely due to the fact that one of them has offended their God. And the question is who has committed the offense? It's important to note, that, again, with culture, that the belief of many of their deities was that their deities were very much like superpowered humans, easily offended, very fickle, and that anyone could have done something that had somehow offended one of the gods and the gods was bringing punishment upon them. So they cast lots in verse 7 so they can figure out how this evil has come upon them. And the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where are you from? And what is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's interesting here because Jonah, in his statement, in his knowledge, he knows more than the way his heart was leading him. Because Jonah begins to talk about God. And when he talks about God, he attributes to God supreme power. He doesn't say that my God is a regional God, but that my God is the creator of all things. And for these other men on the ship whose gods that they believed in were often local or had limited power, for Jonah to make this statement that his God, the God of the heavens, his God, who made the sea and the dry land, the people realize a glimpse of the power of the God that Jonah is associated with. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, it says in verse 10, and said to him, What is this that you have done? If your God is this great, then obviously what's happening to us is somehow connected to you. So what have you done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be made quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Now I want you to notice this, because this reveals something important about Jonah. Jonah's theology. In this little section, we've learned that Jonah has an understanding of the supremacy and the power and the authority of God. He also has an understanding of the justice of God. Jonah knows he has disobeyed. He deserves punishment. He 
He understands God has the authority and the right to judge him. He has disobeyed, therefore he deserves the wrath of God placed upon him. So when Jonah says to these men, throw me overboard because I'm the cause of this. What Jonah is expecting is death. Jonah is expecting that he will be cast over and he will die for his disobedience. That the other men may be spared because he understands in the justice of God that he is the one who has committed the sin. He is the one that deserves the punishment. He is the one who deserves death. It is clear in the mind of Jonah the justice of God. And it's important for us to grasp this because this understanding Jonah has a clear sense of. Jonah's problem, what motivated him to disobey God and to run in the opposite direction from the presence of God isn't Jonah's understanding of justice, but of the rest of God's character, which we're going to begin to unpack tomorrow. I hope you learned something here this morning. I hope that you'll share this with somebody else, and I hope it's an encouragement to you. God bless.